Hey, good day, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the OIG Roundtable. It's really more of today. I think it's an OIG card table uh, <laughs> because we've got uh, it's just you and me, Matt. Uh, Wade is on PTO doing fishing or something or whatever they do in Wisconsin in the summer. <clears throat> and Jason is apparently in Alabama with his RV or something. I don't I don't even know anymore. He's on a whirlwind tour of apparently southern eateries, uh, any place where there's a Waffle House or a uh, Cracker Barrel, I think. Well, he's in him. the south. He's going to see a lot of those. <clears throat> he's yeah, he's in he's in the south. It's good stuff, though. So yeah. welcome, welcome, yeah. welcome. You and I, we're going to we're going to crush it today. So today we want to talk about a topic that is a, a pretty important and prevalent topic out there. And and, and I think it 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 does lend itself to some discussion and some of the issues that are out there with playing in the sandbox. And that's the whole premise of deconfliction. And deconfliction should be something that all SIUs consider <clears throat> when they're working on cases. Now, when we talk about deconfliction, what we're really talking about are instances in which you're opening up a case based upon some allegation of fraud or credible allegation or some something that's leading you to want to start a case. And as you're potentially going down that road, are you going down a road in which someone else is already investigating? Now, we're not talking about deconflicting with other SIUs. That's a whole other conversation, right, about who's the race to the finish line. But we are talking about whether or not there's the potential or the prospect that law enforcement is already involved in a case that you don't know about. And, you know, deconfliction occurs uh, uh, within law enforcement organizations all the time. OIG had a memorandum of understanding with the FBI where they would exchange a list of new cases that were opened and discuss whether or not each party had a case. We in New Jersey would regularly speak to our FBI counterparts, even outside of that process, and just say to them, hey, we just got this allegation. Do you guys have anything on that? Have a discussion. Sometimes you find that there's actually an open FBI case and it has nothing to do with your healthcare fraud. It might be some other fraud <clears throat> that you're not even aware of, or it could be some other violation that has nothing to do with healthcare fraud or even or even white collar. But more importantly, is that this whole premise of deconflicting from the SIU perspective with law enforcement, which is why this relationship with law enforcement is probably one of the key relationships that you can you can have. So you know, and I give my great example is I was working on a case years ago involving a physical therapist who was providing physical therapy services to children in the New York City public school system. So they contract out New York City public schools, like a lot of school districts, have a Medicaid NPI number. And so um, uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech, language, pathologists, those are required services uh, for a lot of school districts. They contract with the city of New York. They go render those services. <clears throat> they invoice the city for that work. The city then submits a claim to Medicaid to get reimbursed, and then they pay the provider for those services. This provider was billing for services he wasn't rendering. He would show up at the school. The kid would be out sick or transferred, and the physical therapist didn't know, and he was submitting claims for services that he didn't even render. And I went out and served a subpoena one day to a medical office <clears throat> where the provider had a connection, and the receptionist said, well, we already got this subpoena. And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, well, two days ago, a couple of people showed up with a subpoena. Uh, they must have worked with you because why would you be back here? And I said, you have that subpoena. And she showed it. And it was New York City Department of Investigation, which oversees it's basically now New York City's uh, OIG. Um, interestingly enough, that wouldn't have even been an organization we would have normally looked to deconflict with because we would have probably had that issue no matter what. Um, but it turned out that we wound up joining forces and working on it. It was by happenstance. But, you know, part of deconfliction is the known. And then, you know, are you deconflicting with organizations that you don't even think might be part of it? And there's it's impossible to know. Who would have ever known that New York City Department of Investigation was doing this? But let's talk a little about that. Let's talk a little bit first at the OIG perspective, right? Because you also had to do some deconfliction related things, right? The UPICs got involved in deconfliction. When you were at headquarters, that was a big piece of it. And even now, you know, and our uh, our New York SIU director, April Cameron, who was on a couple of weeks ago, she's actually spearheading a, a project to help to create a deconfliction process on our on our New York plans. Yeah, it, it is a it is a very important aspect, especially when you consider law enforcement may be doing something covert. They have an undercover operative going in and getting services and they're monitoring that. And you're going in even on a regulatory affair, you know, an overpayment type of situation alerts the provider that 
they're being looked at and can and can really compromise the undercover operation that's going on. So early deconfliction with law enforcement is very important. Uh, the complicating factor is, and you brought it up, who do you deconflict with? You've got the OIG, the FBI, Postal Service, Postal IG, the Mafuku. All of those agencies could be investigating a provider for healthcare or other violations. So how do you deconflict with all of them? And I think the solution to that is find one that you can rely on, whether that's the OIG, the Department of Justice, U.S. Attorney's Office, the Mafuku, whoever you have a good relationship with, and see if they can then extend that deconfliction to their partner law enforcement agencies. I know in New York, I think there's actually a, a database of about 25 different law enforcement agencies, case indices that the OIG can go into and say, you know, is this person under investigation by any or all of you? And it's very collaborative and, and works well. When I was with the OIG, one of my jobs was to go through the FBI letterhead memorandums that they would put out and give to us to make sure that they that they were deconflicting with with us. And we would look at our case indices to see if we had anything. We would send them our opening memorandums and and we would collaborate that way. And it was it was a manual process and there were some gaps and things like that and timing but uh, overall it worked very well and it did forestall any of those types of situations where you know we're going in the front door they're coming in the back door and you know they you know don't know what's going to happen at that point right. so it was right and that's a, a huge it's a huge challenge i mean you know you think about all of the federal organizations that could be involved in healthcare fraud investigations, you know, where there's that overspill. You, I mean, VA, OPM OIG, VA OIG, Postal Inspection Service, Postal OIG. Now with uh, some of the crossover cases involving COVID, you've got uh, SBA OIG, you've got, you know, a slew of other organizations that are out there on the federal side. <clears throat> then you get then you get beyond that, and then you start thinking in terms of you know state organizations and and things of that sort. So it really does become very tricky to deconflict. But I think your um, your recommendation of at least pick one agency and and kind of you know see where that goes. You know I would think from from my perspective at least the two that I would consider would obviously be FBI and and U.S. local my local U.S. Attorney's Office, and even more so the U.S. Attorney's Office because they typically get. Uh, they typically get a notification of something sooner than later because you know you want to right you want to get a prosecutor on board earlier than later so that you're not spinning your wheels but that becomes you know that's inherently a challenge that people are stepping over their uh, stepping over themselves and then collaterally you're not just stepping over yourselves but it really becomes almost a race to the finish line are you really going to work in a collaborative way and I think, you know, from the SIU perspective, you know, we see that the collaboration in the SIU space is a little bit more of a challenge, right? We've talked about this. If you've identified an overpayment of a million dollars, you're not sharing that with other SIUs because the pot of money is only so much. But, you know, it does it does lend itself to that, at least that discussion relative to having that law enforcement liaison on the, S on the SIU side. So let's talk a little bit about that yeah. because um, you've got obviously things like the NHCAA and Cirrus and being able to go in and, and post schemes and maybe be a little generic. And there's always a reluctance. You know, I always talk about we would we would hold a healthcare fraud working group meeting at the at the FBI space in Newark. Uh, the former chief of the healthcare unit in Newark had spearheaded this. We would have a room of 100 or 150 interested people participating in these meetings. And then we would open up the floor for people to discuss cases generically. We wouldn't even ask. We would just say, talk, you know, in generic terms. I have a chiropractor billing for this code and just leave it at that and just let it be to give people information. And you wouldn't even get people discussing it in, in those forums. Um, and there are lots of these forums. In New York, the FBI runs a, a yearly or biannually meeting uh, through uh, a coordination of efforts that they have uh, interested parties, 50, 60 in, in different organizations are brought in there. April is working very hard to try to do deconfliction on some of these. But 
What are some of the things that you see that are, you know, what are some of the successful takeaways for our SIU viewers, uh, you know, on this deconfliction? Because it's a never ending process. Number one, it can it, you can get mired in doing nothing but communicating and trying to figure out what's going on. But it, it also can if you don't do at least a semi try effort, uh, you could run yourself into a pickle later on. Right. Well, the the successful outcomes that I've seen are when the let's say there is a conflict, there is a, a law enforcement case open on the same provider. They're going to ask the SIU, the plan to step down to, you know, don't do anything more. Don't contact the provider. Don't contact the, the members. We don't want to, you know, compromise the case in any way. But at the same time, they bring in the SIU's losses as part of their victim, you know, bring in whatever claims it may be, whatever facts that the SIU has gathered up to that point, whatever data, they bring that into their case. And so they basically work the case for the SIU. And at the end, the SIU becomes a victim that at sentencing or at settlement, they get, you know, they get restitution uh, for for their losses. And that's a huge success because there's less resources expended by the SIU. And it may take a little longer because it has to go through the judicial process. But at the end, they do get their full restitution if the money is there. The, the government is going to take the government's money first. You know, so if it's a Medicare or Medicaid case, they're going to grab those program funds from the provider first, and then any money left over will then go to the other victims. And if this SIU has, you know, been cooperative and deconflicted and brought the facts forward, they will be considered, you know, one of the primary victims in, in the, at the sentencing. Right. And that, and that's a piece of the puzzle that's important, because if you have a case that has a whatever the dollar amount is that you're initially investigating by bringing in the SIUs and rolling them into the case, you increase that potential loss amount, you increase the potential prison exposure on a criminal conviction should you be able to seek one through either a trial or through a, through a plea. I mean, at the end of the day, whether that money is actually there or not is another story, but there'll at least be a restitution order. <clears throat> and then that lends itself to the prospect of the U.S. Attorney's Office Financial Litigation Unit going in, <clears throat> seizing assets, seizing substitute assets, doing the, you know, sort of the skip trace of money and, and things of that sort. So there are collateral benefits to, to having uh, your loss amounts being included in a case. It's, there's no downside to it. But the, the importance of this is in that initial deconfliction, if, an, if a law enforcement organization does in fact have a case, you've now been put onto the same page where right. you're not having a duplicate effort and you're able to at least coordinate that. And the one important piece of this for the SIU people is you're, you're likely going to get uh, bombarded with requests for information, subpoenas and things of that sort. So uh, I don't want to say be careful what you wish for, but you know, you got to be careful what you wish for. <clears throat> and the biggest piece is what you just talked about, which is essentially this premise of stand down, where when law enforcement comes in and they direct you to stop your activity and you want to play nice in the sandbox, you do that, you kind of put your case in abatement. And obviously the frustration is that you you put your case into limbo while it's being worked and worked is in air quotes because sometimes right. it's not. And then, you know, sometimes it's two, three, four years later, somebody's made the determination that there is no viability of this case. They close it and they return it. You know, I remember, you know, oftentimes OIG, we would return cases back to the UPIC for any action the UPIC deems necessary was kind of the colloquial phrase which really meant do what you guys are going to do. And in some cases it was nothing because the case was too old uh, right, the to, claims to pursue. Been, yeah. And in the SIU space, sometimes you only have that 12 month look back. And so you've, you've put yourself a rock in a hard place. So it's a, it's a very delicate, it's a very delicate balance, right? How do you make those yeah. decisions? Yeah. The, and with, between the UPICs or, or their predecessors and the OIG, it was a, at times contentious relationship because CMS wanted to take actions and to to make their program whole, and the OIG was was not allowing that, or DOJ was not allowing that. So they they basically had a parting of the ways for a little while until right. you know the UPICs were formed and they created that memorandum of understanding where they created a new system where the OIG would 
take these zone restrictions and then but then there was accountability for that every three months there was a hey how's this case doing can we take action now would any action compromise your case and the oig was very transparent about yes or no and here's why and here's how long we think it's going to take where before it was the black hole of you know the dnp the do not pursues and and two or three years ago by before anybody would know you know the status of right. the case similarly for SIUs, some of the clients that we have, the states are allowing us to, let's say we deconflict with the Mafuku or the state o, the state OIG or whoever it may be, the state, aid, state uh, Medicaid agency, and they say stand down. We're allowed quarterly to send in a request to, hey, we'd like to take the overpayment action for this on this case, ba 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 ba, and they have to give us a response. So right. it's not that it's going into a uh, you know the black hole anymore. We're having a, a dialogue with with the with the with the entity. So it's right. giving us the opportunity to take you know to take action. And a little bit of that is the premise that hopefully there's light at the end of the tunnel. And it's not a train. You've got the ability you know right. to do something with that. And you know one of the things that makes us a little bit unique is the fact that as an outsourced SIU, you know we have a heavy concentration of plans in the New York uh, in the New York area. And there's an inherent deconfliction from SIU plan to SIU plan because we are maintaining all of that data, but also it gives us the ability to look across payers <clears throat> and the aggregate of data. And while we're not necessarily aggregating data, if we see that we have a provider um, committing um, a fraud waste or abuse issue in one plan, we can look and see if that same pattern of behavior exists with other plans that they may be similarly billing. So you know, we've got a little bit of a deconfliction within the plans itself because we're the ones that are controlling those investigative efforts. Um, but certainly it then helps when we're having conversations in New York, for example, with Mufuku or, or Omic. But <clears throat> what are, you know, as we kind of wrap up, what are your couple of kind of key takeaways for people in the SIU space on how to be able to effectively deconflict in an environment that is one, not necessarily one ripe for collaboration, uh, and two, um, one in which the challenges can exceed, you know, the ROI of deconflicting. It's all relationships, right? So if you as a as as an SIU, you know, have a person, whether that's you know, an internal person you that acts as the point of contact to the local law enforcement agencies, the federal law enforcement agencies, the Mafuku, the state agency, and and so that they have a familiar face that you know you go to them and with, with your cases and deconflict at the beginning when you're about to start a case and then deconflict through that same person before you take a formal action, whether that's the overpayment or a, a suspension, a prepay or whatever, deconflict again to make sure that those actions are not going to compromise anything. And in the mid and in between those times, that contact person needs to try to establish ongoing relationships with those law enforcement agencies because it could really benefit the SIU when law enforcement starts sharing information with you. And they're not going to do that if you're a stranger. But they might be coming across trends. They might be coming, coming across individual providers that they find problematic. Sometimes they don't have the resources to investigate them. Or they're investigating them and they see that there are other victims. They'll tell you about them. And you can, you know, gain from that. So it's a it's a win win for you to have a good running dialogue with the agencies with which you have to deconflict. Yeah, I mean that's the most important part, right? I mean, we talk all the time about the importance of a law enforcement liaison and yeah. how so many plans do not have a law enforcement liaison. So many plans do not interact as prolifically as they should with uh, law enforcement and their counterparts. <clears throat> and some just don't even participate to the level that they should in some of these regional, um, you know, meetings and these information sharing meetings where, you know, even if you're there to be a listener, you can walk away with a list of attendees that, you know, now you've got yourself a whole group of contacts. And it's always about, it's never about what you know, it's how big your Rolex is, right? It's your contact yeah. sheet. It's being able to reach out to them. 
And even if you're speaking in semi-generic terms, to be able at least to deconflict that you're not stepping over each other's toes, because I think, you know, and you'll agree with this, you don't want to race to the finish line because that that creates, um, it doesn't create efficiencies, right? You're shortcutting things to try to yep. get to where you need to be as quickly as you can. <clears throat> and maybe you you step over a couple of the key points that you need to take. So it's an, it's an important piece. And I think people sometimes miss the value of having that law enforcement liaison to be that point person, dealing with the subpoenas, dealing with the requests for information, uh, being that voice to speak the healthcare, the legal, the law enforcement, um, be that face that everybody knows because there's a lot of change in the industry, right? So having a one person that's your point of contact who's a consistent person really does lend itself. And, and it's even better when that person is a local person who understands what that um what what that uh social landscape is it's probably the yeah, best and we're, we're, it, but... you know our clients and we are so lucky to have april doing that for us as part of her duties because you know she she has her contacts remaining with the oig that she goes to and it's it's seamless the the, the right. deconfliction and that's an important it's a very important piece you know the you know here in, in in new jersey the 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 unit has had a number of changes over the years uh, the person that was the chief of the healthcare unit just left, and a former AUSA that I worked with for many years that I respect very much just came back to the U.S. Attorney's Office, now the chief of that unit. And most of the people that I think are in the environment probably don't even know him because he left a couple of years ago, and there's just been this changing landscape of AUSAs over there. And so, you know, having having those personal connections to those people to be able to discuss things at a certain level, it really does go a long way. But that that deconfliction process is an important piece, I think, that oftentimes gets either sidestepped or uh, or skirted around in some veiled way, just because it is some. It may be time consuming, and it may be a difficult task. And the question is, at what point do you stop trying to deconflict, and you know where do you, you know, how far do you go with that? So, yeah, it's a it's a challenge, but I think that the, the law enforcement liaison certainly does help with that, um, yes. and 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 help to at least negate some of it we can't we can't 100 percent negate it but you can certainly look to <clears throat> at least give yourself a level of comfort that you've at least made a really good college try yep, yep. yeah <clears throat> it's a it's a tough topic um it's a tough topic because it's go it, it at some point i think it happens to everyone <clears throat> in one way or another where you stepped on someone's toes didn't realize there was a parallel investigation going on by some entity that is not even associated with you and you're trying to figure out what's the best way to What's the best way to deal with it? Yeah, whether it's the provider telling you, why are you sending me this request for medical mm -hmm. records when I just got a subpoena from so-and-so, or you go to collect the funds and there's a freeze on the on the account. Right. I think more, uh, uh, probably more common is the provider saying, you guys are, you know, what's going on here? Yeah, yeah. Why am I? Just, why are so many people looking at me at the same time? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep. I must be. I must be a popular provider. Well, maybe if you weren't <laughs> committing all of this fraud, you wouldn't be as popular as you. You've created your own popularity, right? So, yeah. Good stuff, Matt. Yep. I Good appreciate it. You. I miss. I it, miss Wade and Jason, but yeah, we, you know, everybody's got to have time. It's the summer. People need to have time off. You know, you sleep when you die. Apparently, it's how you and I work. So. Warren Zevon. Yeah, you sleep when you die. Uh, when you're not the werewolf of London, that's what you are. You sleep when you die. Uh, so listen, as always, thanks to everyone who downloads our podcast, listens to it, catches it each week in the newsletter. Again, you can catch our newsletter every Friday in your inbox. You don't have to click on anything other than signing up. You can do that from our website, uh, advise, A-D-V-I-Z-E, health.com. You can even go up on our website. You'll get a splash screen. You can sign up for the newsletter there. Uh, our weekly podcasts are on the website they're on our youtube channel they're on spotify we've got them all over the place we've got great linkedin lives coming up in the next few months uh the next three or four months we've got some really good uh presentations so keep your eyes open for that uh, and as always we appreciate everybody's support and we'll see you on the next uh, oig roundtable thank you all